Kingston. Um, it's a really great pleasure uh, to welcome both uh, Luisa and Matthias here uh, tonight. I'm, I'm sure most of you know that uh, both uh, Luisa and Matthias have been practicing both in London and in Berlin for a long time. And uh, of course the difference between what they have been doing in London and what they've been doing in Berlin is, uh, is quite a lot because in London they do small things and in Berlin they seem to do very big things. Um, but I think also uh, what seems to be very important is that the London project over a number of years has been in a sense like a testing ground for many of the things that they have done in Berlin where they uh, have experimented with uh, concepts of space, uh, concepts of color, color variation, juxtaposition, all the things that I think are very much part and parcel of their work has been really uh, a part of a very slow methodical investigation over the years. Um, I was recently fortunate enough to uh, be taken around the office, uh, a lot of the projects and seeing uh, both the Photonics building and uh, the GSW. And I think it's, uh, it's really amazing what they have done in a very short time uh, with those projects. I think they're part of a sort of emerging generation of architects who are working in a sense uh, somehow deviating from the architecture of meaning, if we can say, say something like that. Because I think that they, uh, they work with, uh, with materials, they work with color, uh, and construct certain relationships with the buildings, which is not to do with the semantic significance of what the building is supposed to mean, but it actually, the meaning, if there is such a thing, it comes from uh, the materials, the colors, uh, the, the, the construction of the, of the project <laughs> itself. So they're not really trying to be truthful to those, to those issues, but uh, are working with the, with the very materials as the basis of the production of architectural projects. Both Luisa and Matthias, as you again also know, studied at the AA. <coughs> and uh, subsequently, uh, Luisa worked for uh, Peter and Alison, and Matthias for OMA, and worked with Ilya Zengelis very closely. And I think that that has also been uh, part of the uh, the interesting fusion of their, of their backgrounds, which I think has led to, uh, to what has made their work very, very specific. So um, I would like to, um, since uh, Peter Smithson is here in the audience, take this opportunity of asking him to say a few words, because since I almost didn't make it here, I think he, he, was, he, was, he was almost prepared to, uh, to make the introduction. So hopefully he'll say uh, a few words. I also, before uh, leaving you, want to uh, tell you about a book, which is at the moment empty inside. But, uh, <laughs> but we were, and I haven't had a chance to ask these good people here, what happened? Uh, we were supposed to uh, have the book here for the, for the launch. And uh, obviously it's not here. It's supposed to be. Uh, Sparrow from our uh, publications and distribution will be waiting outside as you go out and uh, she will be able to take your name down and will make you a special uh, offer for this, for this book which is only available tonight not tomorrow, <laughs> not next week, but only tonight so sign up, sign up for the book at the, at the discount price so Peter, would you please uh, come up here and uh, do the second introduction Peter, <laughs> come on over. Strange to have two introductions. <laughs> <laughs> but the difference between the, the, the the uh, two generations is very distinct, I think, is that um, in visiting um, Matthias and Louise's house, there's um, how can one put it? Uh, that 
the objects of daily use are subject to a kind of um, theatrical impasto, I suppose is the right word. That is, uh, whereas in my generation, the uh, objects of daily use were regarded as sacred, which I suppose we inherited from Charlotte Perriand, who died last week, age 90, that there's another drift and you could say, well, in this room there's another drift, you know, where the, everything is colored <coughs> white. Um, and it, it produces a, a, a mask. So that maybe the, um, the, the, there is a, a fundamental difference between the the face and the mask. That sounds as if I'm giving a lecture, giving a talk after the lecture, but this <laughs> if the lecture doesn't conform to the You've got to change it. Because <laughs> 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 I'm very happy to, to have Louisa and Matthias here. They're both very affectionate and passionate about architecture. And that's what the AA is supposed to be all about. <laughs> Third introduction. I I'm sure both Matthias and, and, and Luisa will, uh, will thank all the people who've helped them uh, with the exhibition, but could I just acknowledge, since I didn't get a chance to do that, all the people from the office who I know have spent enormous amount of time making this exhibition very, very special. The people from the AA exhibition department and a lot of, uh, a lot of people who really uh, uh, have done extraordinary work in, in terms of putting the exhibition together. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, <coughs> thank you, Moisen, and thank you, especially Peter, for the two in two introductions. <laughs> um, <coughs> I'm afraid I have to change it all now. Um, <laughs> and uh, but first of all, I would like to, uh, in a way, echo what you've been saying. Thank you very much, first of all, to the A uh, for hosting us here with the exhibition and also this night's event. And thank you very much for the teams, the various teams, the exhibition team and the print studio team in trying to cope with our um, sometimes uh, difficult demands uh, and putting everything together in such short time. <coughs> Obviously, as you might have uh, seen already, there was a lot of work involved in setting up the exhibition. There's an, there was an equal amount um, of work uh, involved in putting the catalog together and um, I'd also like to thank the two Isabels sitting in the front row, Isabel Hartmann and Isabel von Fournier, both from our office, particularly Isabel Hartmann has been doing an incredible job um, putting all the work together, archives and printing and everything else is fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, to get over the embarrassment of a sort of double act, uh, we decided to split this lecture into four parts. And this is, if nothing else, this is one thing we've learned from you, Peter. Um, you once gave a lecture together with Alison here uh, in two small parts, which I remember very well. So we're, <coughs> we're not trying to do the same, but anyway, the structure is similar. And I'm going to start by talking about our experience in Berlin, which in a way is crucial to what we've been doing over the last 11 years. So could I have the first two slides, please? first two slides. Um, <coughs> as Moisen pointed out, um, we both studied and taught here at the A and decided in 1988 or 89, something like 88, um, 
that we wanted to concentrate on um, our work in the office and found an office and we did um, work for a while solely in London but as the situation in London is well, was then as it is today, difficult for young architects. We um, started to enter competitions very quickly and because of my um, background in Germany and uh, my years in Berlin, obviously Berlin seemed um, uh, a kind of obvious choice. Also, at the, has to be, it has to be said that at that time, um, Berlin, um, having just been reunited, was in our view, one of the most exciting and most uh, promising um, uh, cities, in, certainly in Europe, um, to work with. And uh, <coughs> the experience of those 10 years um, in Berlin, I think, has profoundly influenced um, our thinking on architecture and urbanism in particular. Can I have the next slides, please? Um, just to give you a, and a very quick uh, sort of rough and ready introduction, to the history of Berlin. Berlin is a very young city. Um, it only started to be a city really at the late um, 17th century. And you can see on the left, there's, it consisted of two smaller towns on either side of the River Spree, which then with the uh, residents of the Hohenzollern Kings started to gain more importance and first extensions. Um, this is kind of early 18th century. Um, there's an interesting, uh, history in that um, the, the, the change of urban ideas and change of, if you like, urban visions um, already at that um, early stage of um, its existence was in, in a kind of rapid, um, uh, in a rapid movement all the time. Next two, please. What you saw on the right-hand side was only one generation away what, from the plan that's shown on the left. The, uh, so-called Friedrichstadt, the kind of center of um, the historic Berlin. First, a radial, um, a radial plan, which was sort of similar to maybe Mannheim, um, a Baroque city centered around a castle uh, with equal kind of blocks. And then the second one overlaid over this um, first idea, consisting of an axial syncopic um, hierarchical system, uh, culminating in the three squares um, which um, uh, directly behind the city city gates at the time. Um, <coughs> this particular site here is actually the site of our GSW um, headquarters, and I would like you to keep this image in mind. The picture on the right shows uh, uh, the original um, uh, city fabric of, again, the kind of early 18th century. Um, it, this was a kind of forced measure, um, uh, partially forced by military and regal decree, and, um, <coughs> and the buildings were all the same, uh, two stories high with the Mansart roof, except for some of the um, institutions such as, for example, the courthouse, which today is the Berlin Museum, with, um, which you know probably because of Daniel Liebeskin's extension. The next two, please. Um, <coughs> I'm just going to focus on one little spot um, within the history, which is the, I, I'm afraid to say this is slightly out of focus, so don't try, uh, <laughs> uh, which is the so-called Pariser Platz, the Paris Square, which is uh, by the Brandenburg Gate, um, and the Berliners like to call it Berlin's living room. It was conceived, much as this um, Baroque plan, as a copy of uh, various, um, as a copy of, a, um, in this particular case, Parisian Square, Place de Vosges, <laughs> Um, and uh, except, of course, bigger. Um, like everything else, the southern square was meant to be a kind of Berlin version of Piazza del Popolo, etc., etc., except bigger, but it was never quite um, what the original suggested. So in this case, here one knows the continuous and um, uh, the continuously designed facade by Monsard kind of goes around the whole square. And the next two, please. And in the Berlin example, it was actually a collection of um, Baroque uh, palazzi of different importance, um, some of them containing uh, uh, kind of residences, important residences, others uh, even kind of manufactories and stuff like that. And the building on the right was the Brandenburg Gate before um, it had Langhans's um, structure um, uh, replacing these kind of little gatehouses. Next two, please. Now, 
early 18th century again, um, the architect classicist, architect Langhans, uh, replaces these historic um, gate buildings with this grand gesture, the Brandenburg Gate, um, <coughs> which was meant to relabel the whole of the city. Um, it was meant um, to uh, mimic the um, uh, populaire, the entrance to the Acropolis, and hence uh, create a kind of suggestion and association to the Greek polis, um, the, the place of an ideal democracy. In other words, um, it was an attempt to uh, at the uh, at the kind of uh, change from uh, kind of absolutist monarchy to uh, uh, bourgeois uh, society to manifest a kind of new identity for the city of Berlin, which was about the ideals of the French Revolution, I guess, um, and um, has since become uh, the much um, well, much maligned and much used um, symbol of the um, of um, the capital of Germany. Next, two, please. Um, Napoleon passed through the Brandenburg Gate as much as the German Emperor did. Uh, the next, two, please. And of course, um, uh, it was it, uh, uninterrupted um, uh, from generation and uh, um, government to government. Um, it was always the kind of the symbol of. Uh, of the city independent um, of the uh, contents and ideals of the government's changing. And I guess it may be uh, assumed its most powerful and its most potent um, state altogether when it was surrounded by the Berlin Wall and stood empty in a kind of nowhere's land which could not be entered. This symbol of what was meant to stand for humanity from hum humanitarian ideas of equality and fraternity, um, freedom, uh, in a way exposed and um, uh, isolated in this uh, space made one of the most pow powerful statements, I thought, of um, the post-war city. The next two, please. Now, <coughs> to interrupt this briefly with um, a little excursion into what we were trying to do at the AA. Um, we was teaching here an intermediate unit um, in the end with Steve McAdam and then the last year, Louisa and myself um, together. Uh, we were looking at so what's now called brownfield site, sites, inner city sites uh, in Birmingham and uh, one year in Milton Keynes. And we were trying to uh, f find ways of dealing with well, what's labeled as the post-industrial city, the kind of city that's made up of new elements and of r ruinous remaining infrastructures of the 19th century, etc. And we, being in England and uh, also, for me at least, uh, looking at the country as a kind of new territory, um, we were fascinated with English landscape gardens. Um, and um, formulated this um, thesis that maybe um, contemporary urbanism could be something like making a landscape garden. Um, we found analogies in the strategy of uh, the acknowledgement of the genius loci of the kind of character of place and the attempt of uh, trying to um, use the elements that were found on site and to work with them to create a situation which was almost unchanged uh, on first view and seemed almost natural, um, <coughs> or even more natural than its original um, state. The picture, as a matter of fact, of um, Humphrey Repton's um, gardening book, which um, we copied from the AA slide library <laughs> about 10 years ago, sorry. <laughs> 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 Uh, shows one of those situations how how uh, nature could be made even more natural uh, by uh, means of landscape gardening. The next two, please. And already in um, the unit's work, we these are kind of pictures actually from a unit video which was taken, must have been also 1989 or something like that, 10 years ago. Uh, we were looking at the city as a landscape, as our landscape to deal with, and we kind of particularly sought, uh, sought out situations which were, on the first view, maybe difficult or impossible to deal with. The next two. 
And this was, in a way, the kind of frame of mind which we brought along when we came to Berlin, um, which we thought was a perfect um, field for this type of attitude and strategy, as it is this palimpsest of um, different kind of layers, as I tried to explain just now, of um, urban ideas of different generations, uh, which are like sediments kind of placed on top of each other. And we did an enormous amount of competitions um, uh, which I'm not going to explain to you in detail, but I mean, this is just showing an urban proposal for um, what was called Checkpoint Delta, one of the inner city uh, uh, border crossing points between East and West. And what you see is these kind of light green or yellow green uh, zones used to be what's called the death, or was called the death strip, this kind of space between the wall. And there was a checkpoint here. And the brief really asked to, re to fill the vacuum. And <coughs> we proposed, um, because this area was made up of a completely heterogeneous um, fabric of different types of um, uh, city, we proposed to add uh, an island, if you like, uh, of city fabric, a kind of patch, which would be very noticeably um, of the, in its quality of the 90s. In other words, rather than um, trying to continue uh, historic fabric and to patch or to kind of heal over it, we were proposing to accept this, um, the conglomerate of the city and to make it and to uh, discover its quality. Next, please. Sure. Similarly, um, projects in, uh, this is in Marzahn, this is one of the uh, eastern suburbs, um, one of the uh, exemplary uh, towns of uh, socialist um, urbanism. Similarly, here we were trying to discover qualities which um, at first seemed like an impossible task. We try to discover qualities and to turn them into, um, into something one could work with and work from the next two. But this <coughs> attitude and this kind of attempt to establish uh, an idea and a strategy and to kind of make it physical, turn it into actually actual building proposals coincided with the uh, formation of what uh, later on was labeled um, the Berlin architecture, which is um, a kind of... Uh, uh, well, you could call it guideline uh, to the reconstruction um, uh, or the new founding, if you, whatever you, however you uh, um, see it, um, of Berlin, um, which uh, consisted of an idea of, well, of the kind of normalization, as uh, um, they would call it, <laughs> the normalization of the city. In other words, um, to um, eradicate everything that seemed to be out of order, seemed to be um, unsuited. And the first thing that was obviously unsuited was, uh, or so the, um, the concept, were many of the East German structures which were um, demolished within the first few years after reunification, these being two inner city sites on quite um, <coughs> important uh, uh, spots in Berlin. Next two, please. And <coughs> instead, there was a kind of, uh, if you like, a late interpretation, um, maybe uh, to some degree false interpretation of um, Adorossi's Architectura della Città in place, which uh, tried to establish a continuity of typology um, within the city and um, the typology chosen in this case, is the 19th century block, of which there is admittedly a lot in Berlin, but it's only one, the most maybe economically most explosive period in Berlin, but um, certainly not architecturally necessarily the most fruitful. However, the kind of 19th century block <coughs> became the, the model, um, typological model for um, the reconstruction, and with it went a kind of a, a rule of a, a number of um, architectural rules, such as um, solid facades and so on and so forth. Now we're back on Pariser Platz, the example I showed earlier, and I mean this is now um, the latest uh, change in the history of this square. The gate, which so powerfully, powerfully stood alone to represent this. these ideas, 18th century ideas, is now being um, framed by two um, uh, office buildings, um, which are, as you can see, kind of uh, closed in a kind of pseudo-historical um, facade, the next two. <coughs> and if you turn around, there's a new hotel, the Adlon, which used to be 
the first address in sort of like the Ritz or Barclay Hotel or something like that in London. Um, in Berlin, it's been uh, reconstructed and I mean, the pictures um, tell you the story. The next two, please. <laughs> I mean, the most extreme is maybe this kind of revisionism um, where um, attempts are being made uh, to, to date, un unfortunately, unsuccessful attempts to um, uh, revise the whole of um, the um, East German planning for the city um, in situations which admittedly are in need of repair and need of um, some kind of in, um, intervention. However, the kind of strategies proposed um, in such disregard of um, uh, previous history, previous uh, generations ideas <coughs> that um, I found it really um, an insult. The next two. Well, <coughs> in this climate, uh, our survival was not exactly easy and uh, we tried to stick to what we had been um, thinking and uh, developing and concentrated mostly on, or in, in concentrate on two things in this context. One thing was to actually document our ideas, and I think that's maybe also something we learned from Peter's generation, um, to write and to kind of somehow articulate or try to articulate what um, we were doing. And we made a book which um, took almost as much as a building, uh, but uh, it seemed to be important and particularly the only, at that time, almost the only way to um, somehow manifest and make physical what, we, what was important to us. The next two. And the other thing we did with not alone but a great team of uh, architects and collaborators is to try and fight for this building um, which has been completed or is almost completed recently. Um, a competition that we won in 1990, I'm sorry, 1991 in spring. Um, <coughs> and over those nine years, nearly ten years now, um, the project's been, been had a, a very rough history, going up and down, being built or not built, and parts, and so on and so forth. And it's really um, due to a kind of to quite a bit of luck, but also a um, sustained effort of a great team of people who at this moment I'd like to thank really uh, for their um, contribution, uh, that we kind of uh, managed to build it. It's, I mean, in particular, uh, they're all here tonight. Um, it's Lucas Young, actually, who's, who's the project leader, and, uh, and he and Brian Lilly and uh, Jens Ludloff are now, have now become office partners but there's also Philip Engelbrecht and Govert Gerritsen, who's especially come from Rotterdam tonight. Thank you, Gov. I don't know where you are. But um, further than these, uh, an enormous amount of people who put an, uh, really a fantastic effort in trying to get this building built, and I think it's, uh, uh, in a way, our joint success. The next two, please. It was the brief. Um, was to extend this building, which was built in uh, 1961. It was conceived in the 50s, and it was located on Kochstraße, still is located on Kochstraße, right next to Checkpoint Charlie. Uh, these people, these who, people who know um, Berlin, this is, uh, Check, this is Friedrichstraße, and Checkpoint Charlie used to be here. That used to be the wall, and it's just here. Um, <coughs> when we were confronted, the brief asked for uh, uh, twice the um, amount of uh, square meterage um, as the existing tower. It's a um, headquarters building for what one would call a housing association. However, it's the largest of its kind in Berlin. It, it's landlord to 70,000 flats, so it's a, a big, really, um, property organization. Um, <coughs> and uh, when we first were confronted with the brief, we were um, nonplussed or disappointed because we thought that maybe this is a kind of uh, a project, typical project for beginners, it's too difficult to deal with and so they give it to the young architects and uh, first um, we had real anti antipathies against this building but we soon learned that it was actually quite an important part of Berlin's history. The next two please. 
It's located on a, lo on a site which I pointed out to you before where these kind of two systems, the Baroque systems of uh, the radial city and the axial city are overlapping. And <coughs> this is an aerial photograph already of um, summer, summer 1910 or so showing the, what was used to be this Baroque uh, two-story placement sans roof, um, relatively um, uh, low rise and low density um, as part of the city. Um, exploded into what um, Hegemann uh, labeled the Steinerne Berlin, the, the, the stony Berlin, the kind of the city of Mietskasern, kind of uh, rental barracks. And <coughs> you can see the kind of minimal spaces in the courtyards and all that, what everything one knows of uh, uh, 19th century Berlin history. And the picture on the right is uh, showing the same site in 1945, and uh, you can see the extent of the, of the uh, damage in this part of the city, which obviously, as it is very central, was also seat of many important political and uh, party uh, um, institutions, hence a kind of target to um, extensive attacks. The next two, please. Um, <coughs> and uh, this is the... Um, this is the exact corner um, where, we, um, where our building stands now. Next to. Um, the building is actually part of a generation of um, sort of optimistic pioneer um, projects, which were trying to re-articulate and redefine what obviously by then had been labeled a city of fascism. Um, and to kind of establish with architectural means, much like Langhans tried to uh, influence the whole city through one, through one building, um, to influence the, the, the kind of image, the quality, the kind of uh, social structure, political structure of the city through architectural gestures. <coughs> um, an exercise which was obviously doomed and um, it, in retrospect may seem a little naive. However, I mean, if you look at the the serious faces of all the Berliners in the background, and also particularly on the absence of buildings, and note the absence of buildings uh, behind, um, one cannot but um, be sympathetic to the kind of idealistic or at least kind of optimistic um, attempts that were made here. This is the, an original drawing or a drawing of the original scheme uh, by Schwebes and Schossberger, the name of the architects who were then quite successful commercial architects in Berlin. And note, please, the, the petrol station at the corner uh, announcing the arrival of uh, the car in the city and uh, obviously um, uh, supporting the idea of uh, an open floating space um, within um, object type buildings. Next two, please. And <coughs> it, it had great importance to uh, Berliners, as you can see. Also, there was kind of, it was topped out and flagged and the, the floors were counters and everything else. It was, after all, the first building of that sort of uh, importance it, within the former um, newspaper area, the Fleet Street of Berlin. Um, the irony of this building is, however, that it was conceived, as I said, in the 50s, and it was completed in spring 1961. And the wall, as you know, was built in August 1961. 1961. And so this location, which was intended or used to be a very central to the historic city was all of a sudden at the periphery of the western um, part of the city. Next to please. Um, <coughs> the, uh, the Cold War had culminated in the airlift and then fin finally in the construction of the wall. And on the right hand side you can see an interesting episode of, um, of the history, uh, urban history afterwards. This building belonging to a, a publishing firm, Springer Verlag, uh, uh, which runs the kind of major uh, daily or some of the major daily newspapers and many other magazines, um, built as a gesture of defiance, built this uh, um, headquarters building right up to the wall. This is the wall. You can see it here, the white stripe. And uh, it's, it's, um, the building is clad in a sort of uh, golden aluminum so that when you look from the east, you saw at the horizon, you just saw this kind of golden strip and it's an obvious, uh, obvious gesture which um, didn't go unnoticed in the, on the other side. So these eight high rises were built uh, three years later <laughs> as a kind of uh, answer to this provocation. And the space between these high rises is in a way, to us it seems at least, a kind of um, 
witness to this particular um, uh, highly interesting and uh, partially tragic um, period of the city's um, history. The next two, please. Uh, <coughs> the, the final kind of urban vision, if you like, uh, that uh, affected this area was EBA, the International Building Exhibition in the 80s, where uh, an, a kind of strategy of the two centers, as it was called officially, uh, somehow um, accepted the fact that the city was divided. In other words, there was a center in the east and a center in the west. Up to then, um, urban planners had always been thinking as the city of a whole, which um, at times had some uh, sort of absurd uh, connotations. But um, Eber kind of uh, concentrated on the repair, what was called the repair of the city. And those, again, who know Berlin, I mean, this is studded with international projects. There's, um, for example, as Eisenman here, there's uh, Hedak, hold on, where are we here? Hedak is here, Abraham is here, uh, Herzberger, um, and so on and so forth. Um, <coughs> and, but I mean, the, the theme and the kind of programs of this exhibition were about housing. And uh, um, the, the actual projects are all relatively low density, and they are actually picking up the density and also the ty typolog typologically um, they're, they're picking up on the 18th century structures rather than 19th century. The next two, please. Yeah. And this um, somehow um, whole attitude kind of uh, was again completely put into question and, and rendered useless at the moment the wall was um, removed and what had happened before was reversed, namely that all of a sudden this site was became again or is today the sort of Manhattan in, uh, in, in inverted commas, the, the kind of central, the central business district of Berlin. And the photograph on the left is, I find, particularly touching in a way because this is Erich Mendelssohn's extension to the Mosse Verlag. You all know this photograph with, uh, from, from uh, architectural history books. It, has, it used to have wings over here. And this is a historic building with a 1920s or 1930s extension, which had been chopped in order to be able to um, erect the wall. Um, the next two, please. Now, to come to the uh, concept of the building, we were trying to pick up on the, these different um, these different traces that we had found um, in, uh, in our research. And <coughs> we proposed a kind of composition of a number of building elements or building blocks, if you like, which were somewhat responding to um, these historic con uh, conditions. Um, there's, first of all, a kind of low rise, which uh, has somewhat the scale of this 18th century um, uh, typology or structure. There is um, a, a kind of building which accentuates the corner and brings the level of the uh, parapet up to um, the kind of 20 famous 22 meter height, the Berlin 19th century topologies. And then there's, of course, um, a high rise which somehow flanks this isolated tower of the 1950s and brings it back into a kind of composition which addresses um, uh, all different aspects, or tries to address anyway, all different aspects of this part of the city, notably the, also the kind of overlay of the structures, um, Baroque structures at this point, and also the space between these high-rise buildings um, across the wall. The next two. This is again documenting the um, as a matter of fact, today all of this is covered in building, but they're only up going up to this height. And this dialogue between buildings across um, is still very noticeable today. And I think it's, I'm, I'm glad that um, somehow this uh, trace of uh, this period has been, um, has remained. The next two, please. Um, <coughs> if you, inside the building, I mean, the, it's structured, um, Analogous to the idea, uh, we have this is the old um, tower. There's a kind of a soccer building sitting underneath the new slab, and there's this kind of low rise which uh, follows the line of the street, picking up the uh, the corners of the baroque uh, 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 land division, but uh, bending in to make a new entrance, which kind of flows into this foyer, which, as a matter of fact, we saw as a type of covered street. In other words, a kind of continuous surface which actually this is how it's been realized as well, a continuous surface from the street into the building, um, allowing for whatever public activities are happening um, within the next two, please. It's, uh, <coughs> it has 
it's covered, it's a very low space actually, uh, very flat, and it's covered in a roof which is uh, split open. It consists of two parts, which are the cantilevering from the two sides of the building, leaving a gap and allowing light to come into, um, into, the, into this kind of deep space. Some of the pictures, I'm afraid, are still from the building site. We only have very few, uh, very few finished um, images at the moment, and this is actually a premiere tonight for you to see them. So <laughs> next two, please. <laughs> next two, please. Um, <coughs> then if you kind of come slightly higher into this low-rise building, there's a kind of, because it is always conceived for public offices, such as uh, lawyers' offices or uh, um, surgeries or similar, has a, a, a double-story um, daylit uh, atrium in the center, making it somewhat like a street where you, um, uh, where you then kind of distribute and kind of enter the various um, uh, offices um, along the next two. And this is the, um, the space today, the next two. And in this kind of quasi-didactic uh, uh, thinking of the different uh, building elements responding to different conditions, we were also obviously spending some time trying to um, associate what would be an appropriate expression of the contemporary condition or even something that would might, might reach into the future. And, we, and this is, I mean, this is like, uh, well, 10 years ago, and we were um, getting in touch with uh, various people, kind of t discussing concepts of um, offices and work and work in cities and so on, and finally ended up um, developing a kind of low energy concept for this high-rise building together with um, Ove Arabson partner uh, who supported us um, with this uh, project right from the beginning and been following it through all the way. This brought us onto, almost sort of uh, by coincidence, brought us onto the subject of ecology and sustainable building, um, not as a, we entered it not as a kind of programmatic um, uh, step, but, um, whoops. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, it was something that uh, developed out of the uh, pragmatic um, thinking of a particular, um, particular concept and as we then were able to follow it through it became a kind of major preoccupation which leads me to introducing Louisa now to do the next uh, little chapter in our talk please <laughs> Um, the second part of the talk, next slide, please, um, is on ecology, as Matthias mentioned. Um, we're interested in ecology actually on three levels, on the scale of the city, on the scale of buildings, and on the scale of the individual person. Um, all of these levels are actually mutually independent, and you can't really separate them, but I'm going to try to separate them <laughs> to make the ideas clear. Next, please. Um, with regard to energy in the city, we, we are aiming to harness the energy, energies which are embedded in the fabric of the city, both in terms of the physical, physical material of built structures and spaces, and the intangible but equally important um, memories and associations which are embedded in the fabric. Um, this actually shows a perspective uh, quite early on before we got involved with fire regulations and things of the GSW tower taken from the existing building, looking out over that space Matthias was talking about, um, the dialogue across the wall, looking out across towards the high rises in East Berlin on Leipziger Strasse. Um, as Matthias mentioned, with respect to the reading of the city as a landscape and as a landscape garden uh, in an analogy, we research and investigate the particular sites with which we're dealing. Um, in order to be able to exploit the positive virtues of any situation, whether the fabric comes from the 18th, the 19th, or even the 20th century. Next, please. European cities are all palimpsests of ideas laid over, overlaid by generation upon generation. And we're looking to create responses which are sensitive to the presence of previ previous generations, 
rather than uh, aiming for demolition and whole-scale redevelopment and treating the site as a tabula rasa. Um, so we tried to bring the memories of the city and its citizens to the surface and in that way to render its history legible. On the right-hand side, you can see a plan which was made in the early 90s under the directorship of Hans Stimmen, who was the Senatsbau director, <coughs> or basically the architect in charge of the redevelopment of, uh, well, architect politician, in charge of the redevelopment of central Berlin. And the point that Matthias made about um, the continuation of the Berlin block as being the chosen typology from many typologies which have existed and exist in Berlin, you can see here very clearly in that everything that is yellow was in the early 90s void. It was uh, bombed out and hadn't been rebuilt. The black were, were existing structures. <coughs> and it was the, uh, this plan shows the idea that basically everything that's yellow should be filled in. And only the streets and the three squares on the left and the square of the two cathedrals and the wide width of uh, Unterdain Linden near the top should be the public spaces of the city and everything else should be filled to the 22 meter block height. Next please. Um, each generation may make its own mistakes but we find that it's more constructive to the, to the embodied cultural energy of the site to aim to repair these, to work with the given in a positive way and creative way than to seek for demolition and redevelopment. Next, please. Um, on the, the, the matter of ecology with respect to buildings, which is a slightly more uh, involved chapter in ecology, um, we aim to exploit the resources of the natural environment, i.e. mostly the sun and the wind, um, in order to reduce the amount of energy needed to run the building. And as most, of, well, all the architects here know, will, uh, here will know that, um, in fact, of energy consumed worldwide, approximately 50% is used in the running of buildings. So it is a significant amount. And uh, with Over Arab, with whom we are working on GSW, they have been aiming to reduce the energy by about 40% um, on the GSW building. And whether or not we will have achieved we have achieved that will be known in the next year or two when we take the measurements and see how the building is performing. But anyway, that is the um, forecast. Next, please. Um, so it's the form of the building and its orientation on the site, which in a way are the first major moves with respect to the sun and the wind. Um, and then, in addition, the internal planning and the materials used in the construction all uh, play a part in <coughs> conservation of energy. As you may remember from the slides Matthias showed, we oriented the building um, north-south. Uh, this is north and this is south, which we also did for urban reasons because that was following the grid of Friedrichstadt, the second extension of the city in the, in the 18th century. Um, and here shows the section of the building and we were aiming to have a very narrow plan on the main slab to maximize uh, the daylight um, so that the, the, there's, a, there's a narrow section and you can see the wind roof at the top which I'll talk about later on. Um, there are five main characteristics. Next please. Um, with respect to the um, ecological aspects of the building, which I'm just going to run through. Um, so, as I mentioned, the, the narrow plan, uh, the, the main function, apart from, we hope, a, a kind of um, elegance in the building itself, is obviously not distant from our minds, but is that, that one gets a lot of daylight and you don't need to use electricity and uh, electric light a lot of the time. Next, please. Um, so that there you can see the building under construction and the, the getting light in on both sides and the transparency when seen from the east. Next, please. Um, buffer zones. A bit like wearing a coat, which actually I wish I had on now because it's quite cold, but the, um, on the west side of the building, which is here, 
for the whole height of the building, we have what's called a thermal flue, which is, in our case, a one meter wide space, about 65 meters wide and 65 meters tall, a continuous space, which acts like a large kind of jacket or eiderdown in protecting um, the interior of the building um, from the extremes of weather. And in the same way, in fact, on the east facade, we have a very compressed zone, but nevertheless acts as a buffer zone. <coughs> you can see here a simulation by over Arup showing the main space being kept warm in this case. Next, please. Um, so this is the east facade, a sort of compressed space with triple glazing, and the west facade under construction. This is the final layer of glass going onto the thermal flue. Next, please. Our sun protection is obviously a major consideration. With our north-south orientation, we uh, get long east facades and long west facades, which is what we wanted to um, create the stack effect for natural ventilation, which I'll talk about in a minute. But the um, corollary of that is that one needs a lot of sun protection because you'll get the low angle sun east and west, in particular the west, of course. And we made the most of having a thermal flu in the sense that uh, we had a protected zone, weather protected zone for the shutters, so we put the sun shutters um, within the flues where they wouldn't need uh, a lot of maintenance. Next, please. This is seen from, from the inside and uh, on the building itself. Next, please. Um, and thermal mass is um, an issue which, particularly with uh, very transparent buildings that have a lot of glass, is, becomes even more important. Um, so we used a very quite heavy floor construction and big, uh, well, with the columns needed to be large structurally, but anyway, we leave exposed concrete on the columns and exposed concrete on the um, ceilings. There are no suspended ceilings to improve the thermal performance of the building, a bit like the way the Romans had huge, heavy, big stone floors. Next, please. Um, however, the main aspect really of the um, measures for, for energy saving in the building is really the cross ventilation. Um, and in its simplest form, I'm not going to go into it in detail because there are many different variations, but its simplest form shows that air comes in on the east and goes out on the west. Basically the, the sun is heating up the west facade during the day, even if it's not out very strongly, the west will heat, it, heat up more than the east. The east side is shaded in addition by the, old, the existing building. And um, the, there's a different uh, pressure, a negative pressure here. So if you open the window a little bit into the flue, you'll create a draft and um, the air can travel through at a very slow speed. You don't notice it as a draft. Um, and this shows the thermal flue under construction. You can see the depth of one meter. Next, please. Um, here you can see actually the um, exposed concrete uh, ceilings or floor construction um, where we, whoops, seems to have broken. Anyway, um, where we put the light, lighting and the sprinklers between um, the different um, pieces. And um, in the winter we regain energy in that the heat that uh, is exhausted we take through the building and take the energy from it and feed that back in. Next, please. Um, one other major aspect of the um, ecological side of the building itself is the effect of the wind. Obviously, putting up a high rise um, does affect the environment around it. And the building itself underwent many um, tests in a wind tunnel. And what we wanted to test is not only the environmental effects for example, at low level when you're walking past the building, but also what happens um, at roof level uh, to the wind which passes across the building, and how could we use this to improve the performance of the flu. Um, one result that came out of the wind tunnel test is that at this point of the building, we needed something to uh, protect people walking at low level on the pavement here. In general, it's quite useful that the building sits on two, two low buildings because um, the wind which comes down the facade then goes into a slow whirl and comes down to the pavement later. So in fact we, we um, 
At the time of the wind tunnel test, we also put a, what we call the wind spoiler on uh, between level four and five to um, mitigate that effect. Next, please. Um, this shows the actual model that was used in the wind tunnel test. Um, but the main aspect that we were testing is the so-called wind roof. This here shows it in a very early form in 93-94. This is a more recent drawing. And uh, what this does is through the so-called Venturi effect, which speeds up the wind which passes underneath it because of the um, wing-like profile, it helps to draw air through the facade, which is useful when it's not very hot and not very sunny. Next, please. Um, some, uh, some of our technical drawings of the wind roof. I particularly like this one in spite of my distrust of computers, and I thought it was fantastic how similar it is to this. Next, please. <laughs> And this shows it uh, completed. It was constructed in, in a very short time by a team of three people in gym shoes. Um, next, please. So, as you may have hopefully gathered a bit by some of the images, but we'd, we're very keen to use the ecological aspects of the building of the project as design generators. And it's important to us to integrate technology with the making of spaces um, and not to rely on um, technology, but to somehow go beyond it and use the ecological aspects for, more, for the more sensuous aspects of the building. And for example, on, on the west facade, where there is this uh, one metre depth to the external skin, um, we're keen that it, it shows the relationship of the occupants of the building to the city and how each person is uh, controlling their own environment and their space, how the shutters will move. And we really see the whole of the West Facade as a large-scale sort of dynamic urban painting that has completely different uh, moods according to the weather or the, the temperament of the people inside. Um, so we're using the particular elements which generate sustainable design um, to create yeah, interesting and um, sensuous spaces. Next, please. Um, and now just a short mini chapter on the well-being of the individual. Um, so the ecological movement's main concern is really to make the environment of this and future generations more suited to humans. But how do you judge this? And is it possible to measure this? Um, and it's difficult to do it in very quantifiable scientific terms. And instead, one's perception of the environment is via one's senses. Um, and our sensory equipment uh, becomes our measuring tool. So everything which addresses one's senses therefore becomes part of the wider ecological idea. And success in this aspect of ecology is not achieved through technological and quantitative means, but on a sensory and very much emotional one. So we shouldn't only cater for the functional needs of the people we're designing for, protection from the environment, enough space and light to perform their tasks, but we believe there's actually the quality of these spaces <coughs> is of prime importance in the well-being of the individual. And we're aiming to combine a sensuality of materials and form. Next, please to give the buildings and spaces which we are designing a specific character and an atmospheric quality. Next, please. Next, please. With materials, we include colour as an additional design element which can transform, enrich and enliven the spaces. Next, please. Chapter three. Colour. Um, so, colour, transcending the factual. Next, please. Our fascination with the use of colour as a spatial medium actually began when we were doing lots and lots of drawing, which is when we had very little real work or commissions in, in the late 80s. Um, and we were enjoying using colour as a spatial medium uh, when we were trying to represent three-dimensional spaces in, uh, on a two-dimensional plane. Um, and we began using colour independently to the perspectives which we were creating at the time and seeing it as something that 
mediated between the two dimensions of the picture plane and the implied depth of the three-dimensional perspective. Um, we enjoyed the way in which the varying tonalities and hues of the color would either work with or against the space um, of the perspective or the space of the picture plane. Next, please. And our first chance to experiment with these ideas was, in fact, in the very small spaces that we were creating in London um, for private clients. And next, please. And we found that we were able to transcend the, or, or aiming to transcend the limitations of the five metre wide London house um, through the use of varying hues and tones and playing off the ambiguity of the two dimensional um, and three dimensional spaces. And here I'm just going to go through very quickly some of the London spaces. And at this point, I'd like to thank the two people who ran our London office um, for the past six years, Simon Hart and Andrew Lowarch, who I hope and believe are here tonight. Anyway, thank you very much for your dedication. Next, please. This is um, the L House, which is represented next door. Next, please. Um, I'll come back onto the houses actually. Just a short interlude here. With uh, when we were uh, experimenting with drawings and representation, one uh, particular artist with whom we were fascinated is El Lazitsky, and with his um, Pran spaces, where he was uh, again looking at the representa representation of three dimensions on a flat surface. Um, and with Joseph Albers, who was talking about the actual and the factual fact um, in his work with colour and the way colour can really um, transcend and alter the way one um, views and experiences space. Next, please. Um, this is one of the London house projects. It's um, H House. Next, please. Oh, sorry, back. Um, just to say, it's a house built in the 60s by one of the partners of GMW, and it's basically a little box which sits on two walls and has a swimming pool on the ground floor. And the drawing on the right, uh, the colours here are a bit off, but you'll see it in the exhibition, is trying to bring together the various spatial um, and colour ideas for the house, which are mainly hanging together on the one pink wall, which you can see on the left. Next, please. Next, please. Next, please. Um, this here following are a couple of images from a lighting design um, shop, which we've done in Berlin for Zumtobelstaff who I also have to say, because I think it wasn't mentioned specifically, but they have um, sponsored the whole lighting for the exhibition and indeed for the AA um, exhibition gallery very generously. Um, this shows the ground floor of their space, the model and the built project, where we were really using the um, medium of coloured glass as a, an additional layer around the facade to manipulate um, daylight to contrast that with the uh, electric light produced by their fittings. Next, please. Uh, this slide's on its side, but never mind. The upstairs space. Next, please. And the photonic centre. Here I'm going to talk about colour in a bit more detail with relation to the architectural ideas for this project. And it's at this point, actually, in particular with this project, which was a much faster one than GSW, because we won the competition in 95, and it was completed two and a half years later in September 98, um, where we were able to bring our experience from the London houses to Berlin. Um, the Photonic Centre, in our case, is um, a pair of buildings which uh, were to house or are to house um, laboratories, workshops and offices on three floors and a production hall on one floor. Um, situated in an area of former East Berlin, this is a huge former airport, which was the main airport for Berlin and the whole area, used to be used um, for, well, weapon research during the war and after the war for um, scientific research. In fact, these three buildings surrounding our site are rather beautifully ordinary buildings from the 1960s, 
here, here and here on the model, which are actually under conservation order. Um, they're two and a half stories high with half a story being sunk into the ground. At the time of the competition, we were asked to produce one building on this site. And in fact, as you can see on the model, two buildings uh, here and here. Um, however, we couldn't, couldn't bring ourselves to put the whole program into one very large building here because of, for this site in particular and its relationship to the so-called lens space here, we felt it was really important to break the mass of the buildings and keep some sort of perforation to the lens as ha actually had been created by these buildings from the 60s, we felt was very appropriate. Um, and also from the point of view of the brief, the different buildings of the photonic center, which were to include these two buildings from the 60s, we intended there should be a focus at this point, which therefore should be easily reachable. Um, with regard to the form of the building, or the buildings, we, again, we couldn't bring ourselves to put rectilinear buildings on this site because, in fact, I don't have site photographs here with me, but the space produced by these three existing buildings um, was and is very coherent in itself and in fact was about the only coherent thing in the whole area, the whole huge area, because many of these buildings actually haven't been built yet, they're just projected, so it was really a, a bit of a wasteland with a few um, isolated buildings, and yet the one actual site that seemed to work as a space, um, it was slightly ironic that here we were asked to place a building as the only place which didn't need one. Um, and we produced these so-called amoeba forms, or amoebae, um, really, it was our, the best way we found to accommodate uh, the brief and to respond to this condition that we defined ourselves of wanting to make something that's absolutely not rectilinear and something which is almost floating like an island within the sea of the site. Next, please. These are some competition perspectives which showed the relationship of the curved building to the existing rectilinear. As I mentioned, this is a two and a half story building and we were producing three modern stories, which are of course taller. And we also felt that through the um, sinu sinuous forms of the building that we wouldn't, the building would not dominate um, over the existing and uh, believe that's true today when we see the result. And this is a view through the uh, space between the buildings. Next, please. Um, actually, could you go back? Sorry. Uh, what I wanted to say, which is rather obvious at this stage, is that the buildings are clad in colour or light. And in fact, the theme of the buildings being research into light, the photonic centre, I should have said at the beginning, made it absolutely irresistible for us to make this a theme of uh, the whole um, ensemble of buildings. At the time of the competition, that earlier model in these sketches, we weren't sure exactly how we were going to achieve that, but that was our aim that we should sort of clad the buildings in a mantle of uh, a representation of the spectrum. There's a very beautiful, uh, more beautiful than these sketches actually, but really beautiful mature trees around the site as well, which uh, were also quite an inspiration. Next, please. I just want to very briefly explain the logic of the building, which has a bearing on the way we use color. So we have this, um, this is the main building, the large amoeba, which has this um, undulating outline. However, the plan is very, very straightforward. It's one spine or backbone. This is the main entrance near the lens space, which is here. And this is a secondary entrance at the back. Um, and the structure of the building runs basically at right angles to this main spine. And because we were designing laboratory buildings, it becomes incredibly important to make very efficient and compact uh, routing, which is very accessible for all the services, so that when the service, these areas are let to individual small companies, um, the various required hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, acid, whatever that's needed can be installed and exchanged without um, disturbing your neighbor. And from the time of the competition, we had a very straightforward concept, which is that all the services would rise vertically, three floors in these sort of cupboards beside the backbone spine, and then would dis distribute horizontally um, in U-shaped beams. Um, 
the services which were needed to be accessed through the floor would be accessed here through the floor into the beams and those which need to be accessed from the ceiling such as the radiators which we hung or lighting um, are situated between the beams. This system frees up the facade or works in parallel with the free facade and the, the, double, the u shaped beams we landed on double columns um, at the periphery of the building which I'll talk about in a minute. The smaller building is a 7.5 metre clear hall space for um, testing and production. It's a very simple steel structure. Next, please. Um, this just, just shows the U-shaped beams landing on the precast concrete columns and an image of the building site with two large firewalls, which were in situ. Everything else was precast and very fast. And these are the fabulous trees at the back of the site near the two old buildings here. Next, please. Um, just a bit about the facades, and then I'll talk about the colour on the building, which is the theme, is that here you can see the paired columns with the concrete nibs on to take the concrete beams. And they are actually situated in, in a smaller double facade, smaller than the GSW one of about 700 mil or two foot four. And um, there's uh, uh, single glazing on the outside with sun protection blinds near the exterior skin so the interior space doesn't heat up too much and on the inside there are double glazed sash windows a bit like the London sash windows um, which you open to get air into your office or laboratory and here this shows that air comes in at each floor level from the outside through a slot of two centimeters or just above the ground in this case uh, goes into your office and out again, or into your laboratory and out again. And then the air travels sideways, and it goes through slots in the concrete columns, and then it rises in the space between the concrete columns, which effectively becomes a small flue, and then it escapes into the open air through louvers at high level. Next, please. Um, this drawing shows, uh, well, this is obviously a drawing showing the development of the colour on the facades. On the hall building, which is a single story building, we were distributing the color in kind of wave like formations. We didn't want to have any horizontal continuous joints because it's a single story space and we didn't want to cut up the facade as we wanted to do to show the three stories on the amoeba. And um, this shows the columns in the entry spaces. And we were there the day they started to paint the columns on one Sunday. And it was absolutely fantastic, the difference between a concrete column and a painted column, because it totally transforms it and actually renders it um, apparently non-structural. Next, please. Um, these are some construction photographs. So this is the, green, the greeny side near the trees and the red side, which is in the space between the two buildings. You can see the slots here. This is before the exterior glass went on. Next, please. Um, I'm just going to show two or three shots inside. This is a, an atrium space where we also brought colour in because it's um, attached to the sky. All the other spaces, like the corridor spaces, we did monochrome in greys. And here we did a series of blues um, on the exposed concrete, getting more intense towards the sky. Next, please. Um, this shows, you can see the wave patterns in the main production hall. Um, and I included this slide from my mother, who likes people in the photographs. <laughs> Next, please. And this shows the space between the two buildings um, and one of the, the large entry hall. Next, please. So, just to... I think it's over there, maybe, no? Thank you. <laughs> um, just one final thought. Um, you were probably wondering why, why VisiWeek and also maybe why stereoscopic photography, which we have to thank for, um, give our thanks to uh, Jan Bitter and Marcus Breit, who've been uh, uh, kind of traveling across the continent to try and get everything onto the film stereoscopically. Well, <coughs> it's maybe a thought which ties in with what you were saying, Peter. I'm not sure. 
I mean, for us, architecture is, of course, first of all, a pragmatic discipline. Uh, it has to serve a function, it has to be used, and has to be usable. And the intelligence of the layout of a building in the intelligence of the layout of a building probably lies the larger part of its success. However, even the most pragmatic of structures will be seen, will be seen as a representation of something. And due, due, to, due to photography and film, uh, we think, as the dominant mode of representation and even perception, it will be seen, or is more and more seen, as an image with more or less definite meaning. One's concept, also of the built environment, has been contaminated by this image quality. In the commercial practice of architecture, this has led to the widely noticeable disengagement of structure and image in buildings. Cladding technology maybe being the most eloquent technical symptom of this cultural development. The subsumation of architecture into a type of imagery is something our profession is battling against, like a dying tribe defending its disappearing language. Architects are associating with the two-dimensionality of image, superficiality of surface, the lack of depth in both the literal and the metaphorical sense. A common reaction of critical architects <coughs> to this shift in perception of their art is hence the insistence of the importance of space and program in an architectural intervention or alternatively the metaphysics of material and construction. This carries the risk to drift even further into ghettos of non-communication. A second, less heroic route leads to the immersion into the warm bath of popular taste and cliched expectations. The next two slides, please. To some degree, to some degree, we we'll probably, we we'll probably also have to admit guilt to the first of the two fallacies. Although we like to raise our awareness to the fact that in architecture it is not the wishful concepts which affect our environments most, but the way they are being turned into a physical presence. The acceptance of the two-dimensional surface as a screen of our perception is a factor which we, which we like to operate with. It's a condition of the, consult of the cultural context to be addressed and to be worked with critically yet constructively, much as we would deal with urban fabric or the climate. And as a matter of fact, it's the capitulation to the power of the image and its tenuous relationship to physical reality, which seems to give us the freedom to refine and redefine the space in front and behind the surface. Thank you very much. I hope that there will be uh, some questions after that uh, <coughs> provocative four-part yeah. introduction to the project. Who would like to start? One of these days, I'm going to refuse to ask the first question. Come on, be brave. Do you have a question? Who has a question? <laughs> You're a publisher. <laughs> Can you just get the microphone? Come to you. It's a question about the design of the GSW building. Could you speak about the relationship with the old building, the building you're extending, which you seem to, to avoid? Have you spoken about the, uh, the big golden building and, and the ones on, on the other side of the lawn? Is that it? Um, it's not on purpose that we haven't talked about it much tonight. I think it's, we're trying to do a shortish <laughs> lecture. 
for me, the old building is really, well, it was the given of the site, as you like, if you like, as well as the history of the site, which actually generated the whole design. And for me, it's incredibly important, the, the fact of the old building. And we were trying to, uh, you can use a term that Rem Koolhaas would use in uh, sort of retrospective integration to try and bring it back to, to life, really, to reintegrate it back into the city. At the time of its uh, genesis, it was set back from the main street because they were intending to widen Kochstrasse in the way they widened, were to widen Leipziger Strasse. So it was set back and with a strip of rather useless grass in front. And so we felt that the building was very much maligned and unfairly criticised in urban terms as well as its uh, failing uh, technical um, points. So we, we were very keen to be able to reintroduce it to the life of the street by putting low-level buildings um, in front of it against the street with street activities and also to um, connect our new slab, the new tower, against it. We were able on every floor to connect the, the floor plan of the old building of 500 square metres with 500 of the new one. And in fact, our initial conception was that the old building would have mainly cellular offices because that was the way in which it's designed and is more suited. And then the new building, we would offer open plan as architects always like to offer. But in fact, on the new building, one can also do cellular spaces. So we very much see it as the, I mean, it's an absolute whole for us. It's not uh, divided into two parts. And maybe the fact that the photography isn't quite ready at this point is why, and plus it's not a lecture about that building. We were trying to give the lecture in four parts on four aspects, but it's absolutely integral to the design, I would say. Do you have anything to add? <laughs> There's a question, I think, back there in the hallway. Can you speak to the microphone? Yeah, it was a relatively simple question, and that was whether the, the further use of colour on the um, larger projects that have an established budget actually came as a result of doing the London projects, where I might suggest that the budget wasn't as extreme and as much, and colour is free in some extent. So you're painting a wall anyway. Well, there's <coughs> it's, yeah, it's true, actually. Uh, colour is relatively cheap. And uh, both all of the buildings, uh, all the big buildings we were showing had relatively tight budgets considering their size and so on. Um, there's one example which I could maybe explain a little more in detail. is the little round element uh, on the GSW building. It's called, in, on nickname in the office, it was always called the pillbox. It's now actually officially called the pillbox, so somebody calls it the pillow box, but anyway. <laughs> Um, it, it was used to be, I mean, it, it was meant to be in, in, in c uh, covered in uh, pre-patinated copper green. Yeah. Um, that, that was the first idea. Um, and, uh, and we ran out of money, basically. Um, we had to accept a, a kind of cheaper cladding. Um, and with the budget that we had available, we only could use some kind of um, coated aluminium or coated um, steel. And uh, <coughs> it's a, as a matter of fact, the attempt to bring out the coated quality, the fact that it's not a material, not a truthful material, but it's a coated material, um, that made us, that led to the kind of particular color design uh, that we chose on that um, element. So it's yes, I mean, the question, the answer to the question basically is yes. <laughs> <laughs> Could you maybe pass the microphone to over here and while, while you're waiting for that, maybe I'll ask you a question related to this issue of color. It might be a slightly unfair question. <laughs> in that um, given the, the, the final uh, um, statements about the relationship uh, of architecture to image, um, I wonder how you feel you are beginning to, uh, or what kind of position you think you are putting yourself into, in that the more, of course, you, you begin to use, or the more you use color in the larger projects, uh, these uh, projects also, uh, begin to, or these projects have a very strong sense of identity in terms of their, their image quality. So somehow <laughs> the recognition factor of these things puts you, whether you like it or not, you probably don't like it, but somehow puts you in the position of actually the, the kind of the desire in some ways or, or the, uh, the, 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 uh, the, uh, the, the concept of the, of the image as a sort of billboard in the sense that that also promotes its own kind of space of desire, space of recognition and so on. So despite the fact that you want to use the color in, 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 in many ways to, to resist 
some of these uh, conditions of the image. I'm wondering whether you feel that you're beginning to find yourself already with the, with the incredible kind of uh, uh, visibility and recognizability of, uh, of the photonics and the GSW building in a kind of difficult situation. What do you do next in terms of whatever you do with those colors? They are so recognizable that they almost have this kind of billboard quality. Don't know. Can I? Um, as a matter of fact, uh, um, it's, uh, the, um, the Photonics building appeared about three weeks after its completion already appeared on a, on a television ad without our knowing, actually. So <laughs> what you're saying is absolutely true. But what I was also trying to say in the statement is that I think we can't, we can't escape this, um, this factor. I mean, a, a good example um, uh, for building trying to escape the image quality and not being able to is, is Daniel's uh, museum in, in, in Berlin because it's obviously it's a, it's a museum about, if you like, the unspeakable and certainly it's a museum that is not trying to be representational of anything uh, yet. It's being dealt with as an image, as a symbol more than anything else. So I think, you, I mean, this is, this is what we have to confront. Somehow we can't escape it. And what we're trying to say, or what, we're, what the thesis is, I mean, at, at least, is that we are, in a way, accepting this. Um, but why ex by accepting it, we're also playing with it, we're also undermining it, we're also questioning it. Or put it like, I mean, I think the experience of our building well, is much, much richer than the image. I mean, you have to go, go there and feel <laughs> <laughs> We have tickets outside. <laughs> <laughs> That's the book that said. <laughs> Oh, well, you didn't mention the book's got lenses. <laughs> um, I, I would like you to, <coughs> I would like it if you could explain more the relationship of, or, or the, the form uh, obtaining process for the plan in the photonics building um, and how that, how that inserts in your uh, di discourse on ecology as the shape of the, the object seems to insert very well with your discourse on the ecology of the city. But then when you describe the plan as it responding to, to the need of uh, the adaptability inside uh, of, uh, uh, or, or adaptability for resource disposition for the occupants, um, maybe I'm just entrapped by the fact that it's a rectilinear uh, plan that you showed us. But I would, I would like you to comment more on, on how you came to that plan and how... You, do you mean the internal planning? The internal the no, the, the, the internal plan of, of the building for the building, uh, you, you had an, an image shot. Yes, well, we on, from an urban point of view, we wanted to connect uh, two points, two entrances, and we wanted to do a very straightforward, economical and logical plan, um, yet we knew at the same time that we wanted this illogical, irregular, sinuous outline, and we felt that putting uh, the main structure at right angles to this spine and combining it in three dimensions with the U-shaped beams and the distribution of services that then that allowed, that, that allowed um, the, the columns to come anywhere they liked on the facade, and yet it maintained the structure and rigidity of a very orthogonal system which allows this exchange of services. Um, does that answer your question? Well, but with, with the orth orthogonal system, um, I mean, your, your, your response to the, uh, to, to, the, to the urban context was not necessarily an economical and logical <laughs> one. No, 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 it wasn't. Uh, and, and and then the inside of the building, I think you're explaining that it is. Uh, and, and then, th but yet, I suppose they're both inserted in, in your discourse on the ecologies. Mm. Uh, Did you want to yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, I think it, it may, it's maybe, well, I mean, to explain it on a sort of factual level, it's the, the building's conceived like an, uh, a laboratory building, and laboratory buildings are very no-nonsense no buildings. They're very, they have to be very regular, and they have to be flexible, and so on and so forth. And it's the exceptional quality of it is is the sinuous form, um, which has a certain rationale in that it creates different depth space, which is uh, something that's quite welcome with a particular brief that we had, and it also obviously sits within the urban context. But I mean, if you're asking the question on a sort of architectural level, uh, then I think that it's maybe best answered with the remark that Peter made at the beginning about our, as Alison put it, put away culture. Uh, it's um, this, the, the kind of the functional, the everyday 
is necessary and that we think we have to deal with and we have to make it work, but it's not sacred to us. So in a way, to put a kind of cloth of color around this and to make the facade a kind of um, uh, spectacular element um, seems not illicit. <laughs> Uh, you can't beat this building on economics because it has a very, very deep plan and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and hence the relationship between net and gross areas yeah. is perfect. No, so. I'm all <laughs> for an ecological, of course, that's what I mean, that the inside. I don't think, uh, or, or I would like to know how, um, like a, a, how in a discourse of, of ecology, which necessarily involves like a redundancy of the system and not necessarily <coughs> like a linear logic, I think the point, maybe, I, I, I'm not into interpretation, but I think that the, the, uh, <laughs> the point is about the dichotomy between yes. the inside and yeah, the outside. Yeah. And given the fact yeah. that you make the, the argument about ecology mm -hmm. as something which is to do with necessity, and you mm -hmm. still construct mm -hmm. a certain kind of architecture of sensuality, there, there is a suggestion maybe, even if you, you're not saying it directly, that maybe the inside is not as sensuous as the outside. So how, <laughs> how, how come that you can use the argument of functionality on the inside and somehow use the same kind of argument on the outside and make it sensual? Why isn't the inside sensual? I think, it, I think <laughs> you, you've been there, Moisson, and I saw you enjoy it. <laughs> but we haven't got those photographs. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, it was in my opinion. I was just, <laughs> <laughs> just conveying, no, conveying the message. Yes. I think there is a question here, and then Irene is here, and somebody's back there. So. Um, yes, my question is about time. Um, a building that took ten years in gestation is is actually incredible luxury for architects these days. And I'm very mindful when you showed the slide of the eight blocks of flats on the other side of the wall, that those eight towers probably took about an eighth of the time that your one tower took. And um, what shows in your building, and, and possibly just to answer the previous questioner, is that incredible depth of detailing and thought that's gone into every, every bit of it. Um, and then to compare that with the rather um, superficial uh, city planning ideas that are going on in Berlin at the moment on the larger scale and the huge developments around Potsdamer Platz which are happening very quickly and I quite like your comment on that. <coughs> well I mean as far as the, the time, I mean I think your observation is, is, is correct in that uh, we did have a, a luxurious amount of time to design this building which, but also at times, it means it's an absolute nightmare because to sustain a kind of planning design team for eight years, I mean, you know what it means. <laughs> um, well, I mean, if you're suggesting that this is sort of unfair comparison, sort of no, 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 <laughs> between, I'm not, I'm I'm not I'm kind of sensuous, <laughs> sensitive to <laughs> <laughs> trying to read it uh, immediately. I'm, I'm not suggesting it's unfair. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm not suggesting uh, it's an unfair luxury. I think I'm suggesting perhaps that your building shows much more thought than a lot of the other buildings that are built in Berlin now, and whether we're actually forced to build too quickly, and uh, always in times of a mm. big, uh, big rebuilding, everything forces us to build too quickly and not to think about it carefully. Well, I mean, that's certainly the tendency. I mean, it also the question of the control over details is obviously in, in it varies from project to project. I mean, we had the luxury of having a, a very loyal client there who was, um, uh, well, very critical at many uh, junctions, but also very supportive all the way through. And so we had the opportunity to actually design the details, which is not a matter of course anymore. Um, so the tendency is certainly, and we experience this in other projects now, is speed and uh, uh, anything exceptional obviously creates problems. But I mean, I think that's a problem that every architect faces the who's, who's kind of trying to do something that's slightly out of the ordinary. I 
may be wrong, but um, it seems that the last time that very large scale experiments were made with color was in the 60s. I mean, the type of images which I have in mind are especially perhaps a periphery or some peripheries of Paris, maybe especially to the north, a little bit to the south, I mean to the south of the periphery, that is. And I, what intrigues me yeah, in those um, buildings in the 60s, there are very few in England, well, I wonder why, but uh, is that the architects seem code or seem to be embracing two things at once. Uh, one was a very technological approach towards the skin, very sophisticated uh, cladding system sometimes. And then allied to that, there were experiments with colors, I think inspired by kinetic arts, artists like De Soto or Agam and so on. And so there was always a very curious relationship yeah, between on the one hand this artistic intention and on the other this technological intention. And I wonder how you feel in your work where you could say, well, on the one hand, there is a very strong and credible, I must add, attitude towards ecology. And on the other, there is also an equally strong um, attitude towards color. And how do you see those two things fitting <coughs> together? And do you think that they should fit closely together? Or do you think they are rather separate things and can have all kinds of relationships? Um, well, to answer the last part of your question first, I think we, we see them as, well, they're, they're different forces in our work, but uh, we really try and bring the two ideas together and not end up with um, a technological solution which just looks like um, a functional uh, response to the requirements of the brief, but we're really trying to create sensuous and sensual spaces, both interior and on the scale of the city, which in our view, as I said, with ecology, we feel it's to do with the well-being of the individual. Obviously, it's all very subjective, but I feel one should design spaces with atmospheric quality where, um, yeah, the, the specific um, nature of the color we're using or the way we're using form and different materials and textures are contributing, in fact, probably even more to one's pleasure of the environment than the purely technical solution. Um, so that was sort of answering the last part of the question <laughs> first. But right. I also think there's a, there's a, a significant, I mean, uh, obviously, I mean, we are, uh, it's not a secret to, um, uh, to say that we, we are inspired and we, we obviously uh, admire um, artists like Richard Riley, for example, or whatever, who, who, are, who come from this, I mean, as far as the art context is uh, concerned, come from this time and background. But um, <coughs> I think there's as, as a market difference to um, the the '60s, in, uh, in that um, I don't think that technology. I mean, in in the way we think about architecture, don't think that technology plays such a sacred role. To uh, um, quote um, Peter, uh, I mean, as a matter of fact, we're trying to avoid it with this kind of uh, all this kind of low energy thinking. And um, the, the kind of coexistence or the coincidence of relatively sophisticated uh, facades and color, um, I mean, I, well, in the larger context, I think is actually coincidental. <laughs> uh, because um, for us, I think this ecology thinking, and it, it, it's becoming a movement, I mean, quite a popular movement, actually, offers, and not many architects see it this way at the moment, I think offers an, an, a real window for architecture, because all of a sudden there's a, there's a discipline and there's a, there's a, um, uh, a kind of quality and, and, and the value also, which architects can offer to, um, to this idea which nobody else, nobody else can. Um, and we're basically just using whatever is available. And um, as Morrison was pointing out, we would also, or we are using in other contexts, materials, not just colors. I mean, the, we chose to pick on this um, aspect now because it's obviously one of the most pronounced and maybe one that interests me people most, but it's not that we want to ex do exclusively colored buildings for the rest of our lives. I mean, <laughs> 
uh, we're using materially using um, all sorts of um, surfaces. I would like to ask one more question on your explorations on colour. And it's tell us whether you can tell us about your experience on working with colour at different scales, from one to intimate spaces of deck and wall, to how you deal with colour on a giant facade. Um, well, to one degree, the way we work in colour on the different scales is similar in that um, one goes through a series of uh, processes or different stages in the design with uh, various um, sketches and then uh, models or uh, collages with the actual colour paint specification that we're going to use, the NCS system. But what is actually particularly enjoyable in the London houses that we can do is really test the colour one-to-one -one because however many sketches and models and ideas we have in the development, it's actually in the actual space with the way the light comes in that the colour um, is uh, determined. And we work in London with a very particular painter who comes to every job, although I hear she's stopping, but hopefully not with us. And we, we um, modify the colour in that we add a second layer of um, pigment suspended in a glaze on a background, which gives uh, also a, a, an effect of depth and richness and texture to the colour. And that is sometimes follows the ideas that we thought we, would, we were doing very closely, and sometimes we change our mind and follow the idea of the day when we see the actual examples. So obviously one can't do that on a 22-storey building. <laughs> so that, that's the difference between um, the small and the large scale. But on the GSW building, for example, the colours of the shutters, we always knew we wanted to have a family of reds. And when we actually came to specify the colours, we made many different drawings, um, I don't know, 20 times or whatever, cha changing the reds in the organisation. But we did test it one-to-one -one on the facade with some of the big shutters. Um, at a particular point and then we realised that the effect of the glass was different than we thought and we changed the colours again. So we do try and test things as much as possible all the time in a kind of quasi-scientific way with our own designing or on site. But the, yeah, the scale is, has an issue. So with the large projects, um, we have to do it in a different way to a small projects and try and test it one-to-one, -one, but obviously not as uh, directly. Does, does that answer your question? Um, I'm very interested in the, the concept you have, or you mentioned about uh, integrating architecture and ecology. Um, if I take that particular point to your GSW building, um, this is directed probably more to Louisa, because you mentioned that <coughs> the building was orientated in a way um, north-south, with the main elevations being east and west elevations. Um, I would be interested if that was primarily driven by the urbanism rather than ecology because uh, I'm very aware that compromises or the ideal solution for both may not always be possible. The reason why I ask that question is because from a physics position it would be interesting to see if you had a north, main north elevation, main south elevation, you have a natural cool north elevation, a warmer south elevation which would promote easier flow of air through um, through the siphonic effect and you would rather than an east-west because you're going to have to shade at some point also the yeah. eastern elevation. So you did mention to give you the credit the point about the architecture as well. What interests me was it mainly did the architecture win in this particular position rather than the ecology? Yeah, it's a good question. In fact the main I, I think the driving force of the form and orientation is an urban one. And, but the fact that the east facade is uh, very luckily shadowed by the existing building and the importance of the existing building to the scheme is uh, hereby underlined, was um, very useful for us. Um, but again, then having, if you were to have uh, a north-south, then you have the problems of shading a south facade or in, uh, different to the ones of shading a west facade. And with our short south facade, we've, uh, we've basically got louvers continually for the whole thing, so it's totally shaded. Um, I personally prefer east-west as orientations because I think it's a more enjoyable time of day when you get the sun east and west rather than full blast at midday, but it, it was driven by the urban considerations. Yeah, I mean, I, I would agree, uh, basically, um, in one way with what you say, because obviously if you had a southern elevation, you'd have shorter 
requirements for shading and maybe your um, your color scheme may not come through so much mm. as well I, mm. I, I would assume <laughs> say, well, does that apply to, uh, I mean, in, in, in your own house, you have the machinery in the kitchen and so on, and the mask that, you, you know, that, that, that is, is, is it a, a useful image? Because I had that um, on the uh, Alexandrina <coughs> Library. Facade, you see, offensive, like mm -hmm. uh, uh, the opposite way, this way. You know. And then when it came to the section, I couldn't work the image of the fence over the roof. You, you, I mean, I, I, I had total design failure. You know, and I've reworked it several times since. That is, I think that the maybe I, one is searching for the armor rather than the because always <coughs> the, the mask, you're always conscious of the body mm -hmm. behind the mask. Mm -hmm. you know, but with the armor, which I think what I was after was um, a complete carapace. I think that's the word. You know, uh, um, so the, the, the animal and the carapace, a, a single entity. Mask and, and, and the face is a, is a different image. You know, that, uh, that and the, <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the marvelous energy diagram, you know, where you reduce the heating to whatever. But the catering remained the same. <laughs> <laughs> and the catering was 50% of the heating. <laughs> It's cold in Germany. No wonder they all cancel. Cancel a cold slap here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. I think that tonight has been a very special moment in terms of uh, the work of, uh, of Luisa and Matthias, and I'm very glad that uh, we have this exhibition. We almost had to force them to do it now, and if it had been sort of delayed by another six months or something, I'd, I think we would have lost something of the momentum. So I'm glad that you took on the challenge, and, and uh, Luisa has reminded me to let you know that, in fact, the book also comes with lenses so that you can see things three-dimensionally, so it's even better value. Thank you. <laughs>